All right, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining me for this talk on the role of CT and MRI in the diagnosis and treatment of stroke. We do have a ARRT, one extra A, CE credits uh, as part of this presentation. So if you send an email uh, to Judy listing the date and time of the lecture you attended, uh, you'll be able to get credit for this. If you're looking at this uh, after the fact as part of the recording, uh, we likely will have a short quiz for you to answer before you can officially get your credit. We're going to be looking at some brief definitions of what constitutes a stroke versus TIA, talk about the important concept of core versus penumbra, look at a variety of imaging techniques we utilize to evaluate stroke, discuss treatment options, and then review what we're using currently for our protocol here at Bay State Medical Center uh, and actually throughout all of Bay State Health. So stroke continues to be the third leading cause of death in the United States. A uh, huge number of cases, 150,000 deaths per year, and direct health costs of some $48 billion per year in the United States. Although we almost always talk about stroke meaning an ischemic event, uh, stroke as a category also includes intracranial hemorrhage and actually includes subarachnoid hemorrhage as well. So patients presenting with a ruptured aneurysm still fall into that category of a stroke. There are several important risk factors with hypertension, uh, diabetes, particularly in elderly patients, and atrial fibrillation being some of the key ones. Uh, hypercholesterolemia and smoking round out the list of the primary risk factors for stroke. Uh, significant morbidity and mortality occurs after a stroke, uh, with 10% of strokes and 40% of hemorrhagic strokes leading to death within 30 days. Uh, the death rate has decreased with more modern therapy. Uh, if you look at the significance, six months after a stroke in a patient over the age of 65, up to half of them will have residual weakness. Uh, a third of them will won't be able to walk without assistance and up to 25% are going to be in a nursing home or a rehabilitation uh, situation after their stroke. TIAs differ from stroke in that the symptoms resolve within 24 hours, and most of the time the symptoms actually resolve within one hour. Uh, affects a lesser number of the U.S. population, about 2.3%. Uh, but importantly, even though the symptoms resolve, uh, they come with the cost of an increased risk of subsequent stroke, uh, developing more cardiovascular disease and hospitalization and death. So usually, even with resolution of symptoms of TIA, further evaluation is indicated. And even though the symptoms resolve with one, in one hour, in up to one third of patients, we can actually see a stroke on MRI on the diffusion weighted images. So the symptoms may resolve, but it leaves damage in its wake. TIA numbers up to half a million in the year uh, throughout the United States. About half of TIAs are never reported to the physician and don't present to the ED. And we talked about the important risk factors uh, and half of the people who have a stroke after TIA are gonna have it in the first 48 hours. That's why we do evaluation of these patients. The current recommendations from the American Heart Association are that all of these patients should have some form of neuroimaging within 24 hours. CT counts, but preferably uh, they would like to see MRI with diffusion weighted imaging to tell you if there actually has been a stroke and to get some better ideas with prognosis. Non-invasive cervical vessel imaging, either with ultrasound or CTA is indicated. And if they're high risk patients, which is what the ABCD2 score accounts for, if they're high risk patients, they should be hospitalized. Uh, we see in our practice that most TIA patients coming through the ED end up with a CT, a CTA, and then are hospitalized pending an MRI looking for actually evidence of a completed stroke within the brain. We're trying to transition to a protocol 
where after the CTA, most of these patients are discharged with an MRI done on an outpatient basis within 48 or 72 hours uh, after presentation to the ED. You may have heard of the NIH stroke scale as people talk about strokes in the ED. Uh, basically, you know that uh, higher numbers are worse, a larger deficit. So an NIH score of more than 25 is usually a large stroke, uh, but even with the lower scores, you can still be uh, evidence of a small stroke. And depending on what's involved, that's may the smaller strokes might still be indication for therapy if they're involving uh, a dominant arm or limb or involving language functions. We need some appreciation of the vascular anatomy as we look through some of our imaging strategies. This is a frontal view of the head, and the key is the internal carotid artery that you see here, supplying the paired anterior cerebral arteries in the midline and the middle cerebral arteries more laterally. Uh, posteriorly, kind of hidden by the brain, we can see the basilar artery and the posterior cerebral artery most strokes involve the anterior circulation, and most of the time we're looking at the middle cerebral artery. This is looking at a couple of cross sections of the brain, kind of laying out the middle cerebral artery territory in the green, so it's a large area of the brain, and importantly, it involves the basal ganglia and the thalami, some of the central structures uh, responsible for motor function, sensation, uh, and speech transmission as well. And lastly, on this for our slides, all of these colored areas are what we call eloquent areas of cortex or cortex that have very specific functions. So included in here is the uh, Broca's area for speech, Wernicke's area for speech, uh, motor and sensation to the arm and face, the auditory area, and these are all supplied by the middle cerebral artery. So most of our efforts to reverse the effects of a stroke and to recanalize vessels are based on salvaging the middle cerebral artery in particular. And this is looking at a cross-section. Another term you may hear as we review these scans is M1 versus M2. M1 just refers to this horizontal piece of the middle cerebral artery. Once it turns superiorly, that becomes the M2 segment. You have much better results in terms of thrombolysis and TPA when you're trying to affect these larger arteries here. So generally, these, this area here in pink is indication for thrombolytic therapy and for mechanical thrombectomy more peripheral clots may not respond as well and usually are involving a smaller area of the brain. So this is that critical anatomy we'll be looking for on the CT examinations in a few moments. Another concept is the ischemic penumbra. So strokes occur over a period of time and don't involve the entirety of the infarct all at once. So at the time the patient presents, you may be dealing with a core of infarct, which is non-reversibly or irreversibly damaged, and then around that are varying degrees of lesser injury, which if you can restore flow quickly enough, you can salvage the function in those areas of the brain. So stroke therapy is largely geared towards trying to save that penumbra, and the penumbra is going to change over time so that you may have a larger penumbra in the first hour after injury. By the time you get to four to five hours after injury, the penumbra may be quite small. Up to now, saving the penumbra, as we said, have been the target of the stroke therapy. And one way we can try to quantify that penumbra is to compare two different techniques, which are perfusion imaging and then perhaps MRI to look at the core of the infarct. Uh, we'll look at those in a bit more detail in a moment. One other th factor about the core is although the, the penumbra represents the salvageable purple brain, uh, oftentimes the core is what determines the bleeding risk. So there is some data that as the core or the irreversibly damaged area of the brain exceeds 70 to 100 cc's, the chance of significant hemorrhage occurring during revascularization increases. So with a larger core, the risk of a significant bleed and patient death increases. <laughs> 
So we have these competing factors of looking at the penumbra and evaluating the size of the core. Uh, we have a variety of imaging tools at our disposal. Uh, key because of proximity of the ED, time required to do the procedure and the value of the information provided are CT and CT angiography. CT perfusion is used in some cases where we're uncertain if we're going to proceed to therapy. MRI is more typically used in evaluating prognosis and looking at the outcomes of a stroke, but occasionally we will use MRI in the acute setting when we're uncertain if there is an ischemic lesion or not. MRI perfusion can substitute for CT perfusion, although we're not currently doing it at this site. The goals of CT imaging are primarily to exclude a hemorrhagic stroke. If there is hemorrhage, you're not going to proceed with TPA therapy for fear of increasing the hemorrhage. If it's a small amount of hemorrhage, uh, it's possible that you may still perform a thrombectomy. And also you're looking for alternative explanations for the patient's neurologic deficit, such as presenting with a tumor, a subdural hematoma, or edema suggesting that there is another lesion or infection going on. And then also you're looking for a large infarct. If you see a large infarct on that initial CT scan, that usually correlates with a large core and increased risk of a bad outcome with uh, anticoagulant therapy or with uh, thrombectomy. So there are some subtle findings we can look at in CT as we try to come up with uh, better diagnosis and earlier diagnosis of stroke. Uh, one of the important ones is looking for hyperdensity, which represents clot or the embolus in the middle cerebral artery, which we can see that in the, that M1 segment of the middle cerebral artery. Sometimes you'll see it as a dot out here in the sylvian fissure. We can look for a change in this uh, kind of triangular lentiform nucleus that we see right here. Here it kind of dissolves into a sea of gray indicating early ischemia. The other is the cortex is a little bit brighter. The insular cortex we can see is a little bit brighter outlined by CSF in the sylvian fissure. And here we lose that high density of the cortex. And that's the insular ribbon sign that we're seeing here where we lose that cortex. And then lastly, you can have the big obvious area of decreased attenuation representing stroke. And here there is probably older lesions involving either occipital lobe. And it's just a diagram nicely showing what the actual anatomy looks like of that lentiform nucleus surrounded by internal capsule and then with the insular cortex out here laterally. And again, here we can see the lentiform nucleus as the gray on the normal side. And here we've lost that gray lentiform nucleus as a subtle sign of early ischemia in that middle cerebral artery territory. Here are some examples of a hyperdense middle cerebral artery and then the large infarct that later results from that occlusion of the proximal MCA. And just for comparison, this is an older scan in that same patient. And you can see that here the basilar artery and uh, internal carotid terminus are the same density. And you don't see any high density out in the M1 segment. And then on the acute scan, this now becomes denser than a circulating blood pool. And this vessel becomes highlighted. The dot sign is one of these middle cerebral artery branches in the sylvian fissure. It can just be this dot indicating uh, thrombosis of a smaller branch of the middle cerebral artery. The current stroke guidelines from the American Heart Association are that you should have a non-contrast head CT performed within 20 minutes of arrival to the ED and door to needle time from arrival to actually uh, putting TPA into the IV should be less than one hour. Um, so that's why these patients come through as part of the hyperacute stroke protocol, which to now we have added most times uh, the CTA as well. We talked already about looking for ischemic versus hemorrhagic on the stroke imaging. Uh, the other goals of stroke imaging are to look for what's called a large vessel occlusion, which could be a target for anticoagulation, clot dissolving TPA, or mechanical thrombectomy. Generally, the tool we use for that is the CT angiogram. And then at times, the question may be, what is the penumbra? And for that, we turn to CT perfusion and MRI perfusion as tools.
With CT angiography, we're able to assess the large vessels of the neck and the head, looking for stenosis or occlusion primarily, but we may also be evaluating dissection as we try and decide if patients are candidates for therapy. We may also assess the status of collaterals uh, to the occluded vessels. As we're looking at the neck in particular, we can characterize atherosclerotic disease in terms of looking at overall burden of disease and look for the plaque ulceration that may indicate uh, a higher risk for thrombus formation and further stroke or TIA. For CTAs, we give a rapid bolus of intravenous contrast and scan quickly with one millimeter slices from the arch to the vertex. Typically, we're measuring the ascending aorta for a certain density. When we reach that density threshold, it triggers the acquisition of the scan. When we decide how to display the CTA, we have a number of parameters we can look at. So we can display these in different planes with different slice thicknesses. There are different 3D reconstruction techniques we can utilize. One is just multiplanar reformats. The other one is a maximum intensity projection which highlights the vessel conspicuity. And we'll see some examples of that. Uh, curved MPR or curved planar reconstructions enable us to follow a vessel as it goes through a tortuous course through the neck or head. And then lastly, we have 3D surface rendering techniques this is a comparison of multiplanar reformat at two thicknesses versus the maximum intensity projection. You can see with the 10 millimeter thick MPR, the vessels are very hard to see against the brain, whereas they become much more distinct on the MIP or MIP projection. The other thing that the thicker section does for you is that there's a lot of vessel fragments on the two millimeter thick slice. It's much easier to follow a vessel in continuity. You can see almost the entirety of both anterior cerebral arteries as they course posteriorly. So you have a much better chance of finding a stenosis or making a confident call of occlusion versus wondering if the apparent blockage is just a problem with volume averaging. So typically we're doing 10 millimeter thick slice MIPS as one of our primary reconstruction algorithms. And this is just a comparison of that increasing slice thickness on a MIP as we go from a two millimeter with lots of little fragments of vessels up to a 15 millimeter, where now you can follow these vessels for quite a ways. Uh, and if you had an occluded segment, it's much easier to recognize it on these images than it is here where you have lots of interrupted vessels. You can also do MIP projections in the neck, but they become a little bit more limited by overlap. Sometimes overlap with the vein will be an issue. Uh, more commonly, it's overlap with bone is an issue and limits projection, whereas in the head, uh, we don't have any high density structures internally to cause those problems. So one of the things we can turn to uh, is the curved planar reformat. Here in the MIP image, you can see this chunk of calcification obscuring the vessel, but we can't see through that to know how much stenosis there is. Here on this MIP, there still is overestimation of the degree of calcification. And when you go to the curved planar reformat, now you're getting a center section right through the middle of the vessel. And you can see that the stenosis produced here is minimal compared to what you would have called a 50% stenosis on the MIP alone. So that's the value of looking at those curved planar reformats or thinner sections. Unfortunately, these take more time to generate, and that's what we typically send out to 3DR for them to perform. Particularly important in the vertebrals, where as it passes through the cervical foramina, you have lots of sites of obscuration of the vertebral artery. Carotid is usually off the bone to a greater degree, but you can nicely see the vertebral on the curved uh, multiplanar reformat or CPR. As we look at the CTA examination, we end up with about uh, 1,500 images and just thought it might be interesting for those who don't work in CT to kind of see how those all get laid out. So we have three millimeter thick slices of the entire brain. We have one millimeter thick slices of the entire brain, which make it easier to look at vessels. We use those one millimeter thick slices to generate axial, coronal, and sagittal 10 millimeter MIPS of the brain.
Uh, usually these are overlapping, meaning we only move four millimeters between those slices. And then we also use images of the neck to generate a series of sagittal and coronal images of the neck, also using that MIP algorithm. What we send out to 3DR uh, is to get these curved planar reformats back. So they typically do uh, each vertebral artery coming into the basilar artery. They do the internal carotid arteries through the skull base where they have a very tortuous course. And then they'll do neck vessels, uh, either vertebral artery, and then either common and internal carotid artery. And lastly, they'll do two 3D surface renderings of the brain where they subtract out the bone and we're able to take these views and rotate them. Uh, these again, nicely show you vessel continuity. Uh, however, they will overestimate some stenoses. They're a helpful technique to look for aneurysm as well. Uh, because the bone is kind of carved out of these images, they can be painstaking to produce, which is why we don't do them in those. And this is just showing some of the value of those 3D images. We have our standard MIP projections, and it's pretty tough to look at these and realize that there's a stenosis hiding right in here, kind of hides behind the other anterior cerebral because you're so close, you see them next to each other, and it hides right in here, but because of that overlap, you can miss it. And on the 3D views, we can nicely see one ACA, and then here is the occluded or high-grade stenosis in the other anterior cerebral artery. And we've had a number of cases where these 3D views can make some of the stenoses and even middle cerebral artery occlusions easier to image. If we need to evaluate the core, uh, we have a couple of different techniques we can use for that. As we said, generally a core volume of more than 70 or 100 cc's uh, indicates a poor outcome. And in one study, uh, despite recanalizing the vessel, half of the patients had a poor outcome because they had a large pore size. It roughly correlates with about one third of the middle cerebral artery territory. So some people would talk about that as a cutoff for when you'll proceed uh, with thrombectomy. One way you can look at the core uh, is to look at what we call the source images for the CTA. So if you look at the CT images, they give you a bolus of contrast. It's in some way measuring uh, perfusion through that scan. Uh, but here you can see that infarct more clearly on these images than we could on just the non-enhanced CT. So you want to look closely at those source images uh, to enhance your ability to detect stroke. Uh, and in some ways, this may correlate with the core. So in the non-enhanced images, we can see this area in the frontal operculum of decreased attenuation. On the enhanced images, there's a larger area of abnormality. Uh, and particularly here, we can see a large middle cerebral artery infarct on those enhanced images from the CTA portion of the examination. One of the big advantages of MRI is the ability to use diffusion weighted imaging, which is the best marker of the infarct core. And usually that becomes positive uh, minutes to hours after the presentation of the patient. So the vast majority of patients presenting to the ED with a stroke, uh, if we do a diffusion scan, we'll see that stroke at that time. So here's a patient with an MCA infarct. Again, we lose that lentiform nucleus on the left side. We can see a much larger area of abnormality on the flare sequence for MRI. These are old strokes on the right side. Almost becomes a little bit tougher to see on the T2 weighted images because of the bright CSF in the sulci, but we can see that the cortex is bright and the lentiform nucleus is bright. But if we look at the diffusion weighted images, uh, we call this the resident's best friend here because it's a bright light bulb appearance. appearance. No one's going to miss that uh, looking through an examination. And as a corollary, there's another sequence called the ADC where that's going to be dark. So that combination of bright diffusion and dark ADC has an extremely high sensitivity and relatively high specificity for infarct and will disappear somewhere five to uh, 14 days after the infarct. Uh, so once an infarct resolves, you lose this bright appearance and it's, it makes it much easier to differentiate acute from chronic infarcts.
And this is looking at an example in a patient where we can see some area of low density in the middle cerebellum territory. Kind of tough to pick up a lesion on this particular MIP image, but as we look at the 3D reconstruction, here is an occluded branch of the middle cerebral artery. So it's still in that proximal segment. It's still in an area where we could target therapy. Uh, however, in this patient, uh, no therapy was performed. And we can see on subsequent images, the final size of the infarct and the best marker again for that acute area of ischemia and the infarct core is the diffusion weighted sequence. So one last tool to add to uh, our abilities here is CT perfusion, which is looking specifically at the penumbra. Uh, so we have a few different uh, techniques on various scanners. Ideally, you want to uh, use a toggle technique on the scanners we have in the ED, where you're able to do a four centimeter volume twice, and you end up examining an eight centimeter volume of the brain inject a bolus of contrast. So we've already given 100 cc's for our CTA. You can follow that up pretty quickly with another 70 cc bolus for the CT perfusion. High injection rate, five cc's per second, and you scan continuously for 60 seconds. You wanna watch this contrast flow in and then watch it flow out of the brain. One of the problems when this technique first came up was people did not adjust their radiation dose. And there are a number of these illustrations in the literature and unfortunately in the lay press as well, where it was very easy to see exactly where the volume acquisition was done for their CT perfusion examination due to hair loss. Um, fortunately, we have a much better control on the radiation dosage and this uh, does not occur anymore. Uh, here's an example. Uh, a patient, 87-year-old, presents with a last known well of more than six hours ago. So we'll talk a moment about intravenous therapy, but once you're beyond six hours, you're not a candidate for intravenous therapy. And most of the time, as you get into the extended time window for uh, intraarterial therapy, they're going to want a perfusion scan to look for that penumbra. So this patient has aphasia and right hemiparesis going on with a left hemisphere lesion. And as we look at the internal carotid artery, it's much less dense. We don't see the left middle street of lottery. As we look here, we're missing branches, but there is decent collateral flow because these are all vessels flowing backwards back towards that middle street of lottery bifurcation. So it looks like there are collaterals which indicate that maybe there's a chance for some salvageable purple brain here. What we do with the perfusion scan is generate time density curves. So the red is looking at an artery, the blue is looking at a vein, and the green is actually looking at the average density uh, in the brain. But what you wanna do is pick a small area of brain and look at that time density curve. And with different equations, you can calculate cerebral blood flow, cerebral blood volume, transit times. And you can then generate a color map of the flow. And this is what we get uh, from rapid processing, which only takes a few minutes after you send the scan, the perfusion data to them. So on the left is uh, the core. So they're defining infarct core with a certain parameter and they measure that as a six, C, six CC core. So much smaller than the 70 to 100 CC core that indicates uh, a higher risk patient. And as we look here on the right side, the green is the penumbra. So this is all of the tissue that's at risk. And you would predict if this patient isn't treated or doesn't get recanalized, that they're going to turn a very small basal ganglia infarct into a very large middle sweep lottery infarct. And here we have our mismatch number of 120 cc's, and it's 21 times the size of the stroke. And most patients are going to have some sort of penumbra at their time of presentation. Catheter angiogram shows that abrupt occlusion of the M1, the horizontal segment of that left middle sleeve lottery, and then shows it recanalized. So now we've reconstituted flow. We can see visualization of the middle sleeve lottery branches. And this patient recovered very well. 10 days later, was able to walk without assistance, had regained most of their speech function as well. So the penumbra predicted that this was gonna be salvageable brain. And in fact, her clinical 
status afterwards indicates that most of that uh, was preserved. I don't have an MRI for comparison on her for some reason. Uh, this is an example of the CT for fusion scan where there is no penumbra. So as we look at the cerebral blood flow and cerebral blood volume maps, as well as the time to peak map, these all show the same volume. So uh, there's not much of a finding here in the CT scan at three hours at all, but we can see that there's a sizable infarct and there's no penumbra. So there is no benefit to be gained here from therapy. And we can see in the 24 hour CT, the infarct now matches what we saw as the area uh, of infarct on the CT perfusion scan. Different scan, you can see the MCA dot sign. So it indicates that there's a small distal vessel that's secluded. Uh, the black area here represents the infarct core. This blue area is the penumbra here. We map them both together so we can see that the penumbra is much larger than the core. Unfortunately, this patient, for whatever reason, did not get treated and that salvageable brain uh, eventually infarcts. And we can see that the final size of the infarct correlates pretty well with the size of the perfusion abnormality. You can also do perfusion imaging with MRI. Uh, it turns out to be the opposite of CT, so that with CT, we're looking at increasing density as contrast flows in. Uh, with contrast in MRI, it's concentrated, has a susceptibility effect, so actually the brain decreases in signal intensity uh, as the contrast flows through, but you basically generate curves that are the opposite of what we saw with CT. And you can do the same sort of analysis. So here's an MRI case. The diffusion scan, again, is what shows the infarct core in this particular case. And as we look at the MRI data, it's not quite as clean. This is a very old study, but we can see that there is a larger area at risk here. And this is the ischemic penumbra as shown by the MRI. If we look for what we want our stroke technique to do now, we've kind of added some complexity to it. Ideally, we want our tools uh, to confirm that there is ischemia, to give us an idea of the size of the area of ischemia, some prediction of what will happen if we treat this patient. Are they going to get worse if we don't treat them or is the full area of stroke already involved? What's the viability of the ischemic tissue? And what's the outcome if we treat them? And what's the risk of treating them? Can we identify patients that are going to do poorly and have symptomatic or even fatal hemorrhages um, from therapy? So as we look at what we can offer for stroke, uh, there are a couple of techniques that we always wish we had and can do more. So neuroprotective agents uh, in particular have been looked at uh, in a number of different ways. Uh, when I put this together uh, a while ago, there are over a thousand reports of different neuroprotection agents that would have maybe some benefit in stroke uh, and none have been proven effective. So in terms of looking or some simple drug we can give that might uh, enhance uh, brain function afterwards or protect the brain, nothing has panned out. Uh, one thing that does work is therapeutic hypothermia. And for those who have gone through some of the BLS courses, you know that after cardiac arrest, the protocol is now to cool the patient. And the reason is to try to save the brain. Uh, so after ischemic insult to the brain, there is some advantage of cooling the brain. Uh, the other place you see this is in the neonates um, <clears throat> who have issues and they put the cooling caps on uh, to try to cool the brain to prevent more of the brain from becoming uh, infarcted. The initial treatments we had were IV thrombolysis. These were established with a couple of different trials uh, almost 20 years ago now for some of them. They showed only a very slight advantage for treatment over placebo. So although uh, we do it frequently and every patient coming in with a stroke ends up with some degree of intravenous TPA, uh, it only helps a small number of patients and it does have a 6% risk of symptomatic hemorrhage with that. Uh, so because of those relatively limited outcomes from TPA, uh, there was a, a large number of studies looking at how can we predict patients' outcome better. 
How can we select patients better? Uh, and should we be looking at time as our major factor? Should we be looking at the size of the core, the size of the penumbra? Now a current thought is to look at the status of the collateral vessels, since the more collaterals you have, the better the degree of recovery you will have because you're keeping that brain alive while you're waiting to recanalize. Uh, one of the big questions is what do you do with people wake up? So if you have a six hour window for therapy, and someone presents after 9 a.m. and was last seen going to bed at 7 p.m., you have to assume that's a 14-hour stroke. So every stroke you wake up with is presumed to occur the moment you went to bed. Uh, and that makes a lot of people out of any window for therapy. That was a big issue. Um, is IA TPA any better than IV TPA? Uh, or should we get direct and try to do some mechanical techniques of removing clot? Um, there were two huge trials that came out in the last few years that established uh, first a role for thrombe thrombectomy and then established that you could do this at a later window. Um, so first was proven that you could be effective in removing clot and you could have an imaging success. Uh, and then we saw that patients were actually improving with a higher degree and with a higher uh, number of improved patients relative to intravenous and intraarterial TPA. The two big trials that came out were the DON trial. Uh, of course, this one was looking at those wake-up strokes, and that's why it came up with the name of DON for that trial. But they were looking at patients out to 24 hours after onset. So if you had a wake-up stroke, you now qualified. Uh, they were using the perfusion scans, as I said, to try to stratify that, and they had up to a 77% success rate in opening up vessels compared to a less than 40% for intravenous TPA. Uh, their criteria were based on the NIH stroke scale, patient's age, and then looking at the size of the infarct core uh, with 51 cc's kind of being the absolute cutoff for core. So they were treating patients generally with smaller scores. Uh, the diffuse trial was similarly looking at patients with prolonged uh, ischemia, so six to 16 hours after, in, after onset. They used a 70 cc's cutoff for their core. Uh, they also had a penumbra measurement, and they had an 80% success rate at opening up vessels, uh, even at those delayed time periods. Uh, these are some of the tools that we have at our disposal currently. Uh, the Mercy Retriever uh, is passed distal to the clot and then released. It resumes this helical shape. And then with the helical shape, it allows the clot to be pulled back into a suction aspiration catheter. The penumbra is a device that is able to be advanced beyond the clot and then basically has an aspiration function. So you're able to aspirate the clot through some of these side holes in the catheter, 82% uh, recanalization rate with this particular device. But what really is used most of the time now is a stent retriever or a clot retrieval device. So here this stent is passed uh, in a collapsed fashion through the thrombus. The stent is uncovered, allowing it to expand, and it gets clot caught in the interstices of the stent. And then that stent is pulled back into the guide catheter, and you pull back all of these fragments of clot alongside the catheter. And most of what we're seeing for thrombolysis or thrombectomy these days is being done with the stent retrieval system. And there are a few additional ones in addition to the solitaire currently. We had talked about patient selection and the target for most of these trials was the M1 segment. So this horizontal piece of the middle cerebral artery. Therapies are now being advanced into some of these proximal M2 segments. As you get out to the recurving portion here at the top of the sylvian fissure, this is M3 and this is M4, and these are targets perhaps for intravenous therapy. Uh, they're not targets for thrombectomy itself. So M1, occasionally some proximal M2 branches. <laughs> 
And we'll look at a couple of examples of how this works uh, in real life. This is a 31-year-old presenting with left facial droop, left homominous hemianopsia, and left-sided weakness. So we're looking for a right brain lesion. And his history has a patent frame in ovale, so allowing the possibility for venous uh, clots to pass through into the arterial system and get to the brain. As we look at the CT examination at 8.50 a.m., we'll keep an eye on those times. On the five millimeter thick cut, not certain if we have anything in this right MCA or not. You can see there's a fair amount of motion artifact. One of the advantages of thin slices is you can make out these hyperdense vessels more easily. So here clearly now is a mid and distal M1 segment that's occluded of the right middle cerebral artery. When we do CT angiography, we can see that there is uh, an occluded or nearly occluded segment of the right middle cerebral artery. There is some flow distally, whether that is antegrade through the stenosis or retrograde, you can't tell. You're just looking at a point in time. Here is the occlusion again, but we can see again that there's pretty good view of the distal MCA branches or collateral formation. This is looking at that same occlusion on the 3D view, which can make these more obvious. Again, we see distal filling through collateral flow. On the CT scan, a little bit of low density here again in that lentiform nucleus. So we're losing that as an early sign of infarct, but the rest of the cortex looks pretty good. This patient went on to CT perfusion, and we can see that we're not seeing any infarct core. So even though we had a little bit of low density in the lentiform nucleus, it's not showing up on the perfusion scan. And we can see that there is a huge area of brain at risk here, virtually the entire right middle cerebral artery territory. So even with significant risk factors, if this patient had anything else going on, uh, you know that the risk is probably worth it because otherwise you're going to end up with a significant deficit afterwards. Patient goes to the cath lab and one good sign is he's already opening up a little bit. We saw an occlusion of this segment right here and that's already beginning to recanalize just with the IV TPA that he was given, but when we look at the subsequent view, we can see better filling of this branch, and then this superior branch uh, is missing altogether. And if we go to some close-ups, uh, we can see that this whole branch was not being visualized before. So he's starting to lice on his own, has some assistance with mechanical thrombectomy, and then looks like he's got pretty good filling of his middle cerebral artery. Again, this was the original site of occlusion, uh, which correlates with the level right about here. So he clearly improved a little bit with the intravenous therapy. Uh, here's our CT performed after treatment, so no evidence of hemorrhage as a complication. And as we look at the MRI that was performed seven hours after treatment, we can see that there's an infarct back here at the temporoparietal junction maybe a couple little islands of ischemia here, maybe just very slight restricted diffusion as this dark signal in the lentiform, but we actually reversed some of those areas that were on the CT examination in the lentiform nucleus, and he ends up with a relatively small infarct uh, at the end of this, a couple of tiny little punctate areas of restricted diffusion more superiorly. So a good result that was predicted by the perfusion scan. This patient a little bit tougher because now we have occlusion of the internal carotid artery in the neck. And as we look in the head, this is the normal internal carotid. There's no normal internal carotid. We cross fill the anterior cerebral through the anterior communicator. That whole left middle cerebral artery is missing. And in difference to the case previously, not a lot of collateral filling. Most of these MCA branches still are not seen. So we're gonna predict from the lack of collaterals that this patient probably already has a large core and may not uh, benefit well from therapy. We look on the, uh, just the CT images. I uh, don't see a lot going on in the way of low density in the cortex, maybe just a little bit here in the temporal lobe on the immediate CT images. When he went to the cath lab, 
there was clot in the internal carotid artery, which we can see here. There is clot or occlusion right at the terminus of the internal carotid artery. So there's no filling of either the anterior or middle cerebral artery. They were not able to pass a thrombectomy device distally. Uh, these combined lesions where it's occluded all the way back to the internal carotid artery can be very difficult to treat. And the ones that have combined occlusion of the anterior and middle cerebral artery can be difficult to treat as well. And as we look at his uh, subsequent MRI scan, we can see that he does have an infarct of the entire MCA territory. And this little hole that we see in the diffusion scan uh, is not normal brain. It actually shows up as a black hole here on the susceptibility or gradient sequence. So he not only has a large infarct, uh, there's also hemorrhage in the central aspect of that infarct, which goes along with a worse prognosis. And one of the things we're trying to avoid with any of our anticoagulation, clot dissolving, or thrombectomy techniques. Another patient, 70-year-old with right-sided weakness and aphasia, so we're looking for a left brain lesion. The arrows show a hyperdense MCA involving most of the M1 segment. We don't see any low density in the brain parenchyma. Uh, again, looking at the images and you still see that lentiform nucleus here. We see the cortex, we see the insular cortex, so really nothing that looks like an infarct on that initial CT examination. CT angiogram, however, shows the occlusion uh, of the proximal middle cerebral artery. There is some filling of some collateral branches of the MCA. There's an area of ischemia in the deep inferior frontal lobe. As so we look at the angiogram itself, this is a frontal view, anterior cerebral, middle cerebral artery stump, so a proximal occlusion of the M1 segment. You can just kind of barely make out the catheter going out across this occlusion. We can see a little bit of flow in the distal MCA. And the final view shows recanalization of that MCA, maybe a little bit of thrombus remaining in this division, uh, but vastly improved flow from what we saw on the initial examination. And subsequent CT in this particular case shows that there is an area of ischemia. Uh, it's not large, it's not the entire MCA territory. It's confined to that little bit of deep frontal lobe we saw. And then there is some basal ganglia involvement as well. So as we look at what's the current situation here is at Bay State Medical Center and how we're triaging patients from the community hospitals into Bay State Medical Center with stroke, uh, it all starts off with that stat unenhanced head CT uh, and patients often come directly from door to CT. So there's very little time to evaluate these patients uh, when the ED gets a call that they're bringing in a potential stroke. As a result, almost any acute neurologic presentation is assumed to be a stroke until proven otherwise. Uh, and many times we find afterwards these patients have seizures or some other presentation, uh, but we err in the side of trying to identify as quickly as possible any possible stroke, stroke patient for therapy. Uh, we want to salvage as much brain as possible. And now virtually all of these stroke presentations are having a stat head and neck CTA done at the same time because the key to recovery is mechanical thrombectomy. We know that the recanalization rates are much higher than with intravenous TPA, and we know that the outcomes are much better with mechanical thrombectomy. So while they're hopefully mixing and giving IV TPA uh, in the CT suite, the patient is having that head and neck CTA examination done. If we see a large vessel occlusion, uh, they typically go for mechanical thrombectomy if we're in that first six hours. If it's more than six, but less than 24 hours, uh, many times in those situations, we're going ahead and doing the CT perfusion because if we see a large penumbra and a small enough core, those patients are still gonna go to mechanical thrombectomy even in that extended time window. Uh, in some situations, we had one yesterday that almost transpired, uh, where it's unclear if there's acute ischemia or not, we may opt to go to MRI to look for that diffusion scan to see if there is actually acute ischemia. The situation yesterday was a complicated patient who had, had multiple recent strokes, had a, a single vessel MCA occlusion,
and it was hard to know if they were having, they had new aphasia, but it was hard to know if they're actually having uh, a new infarct or not. So in some of those settings, we'll go in for an abbreviated stroke MRI examination. Uh, Follow-up CT scan is typically done looking for any hemorrhage as a complication of reperfusion or as a complication of uh, thrombolysis and TPA. Uh, and generally, there's an MRI uh, after 24 hours or more to look for the size of the stroke, uh, to look for any other evidence of disease, and to try to help establish the prognosis for the patient and to decide what medical therapies the patient may be on following the stroke. So in sum, we've uh, taken a look at uh, definitions of stroke versus TIA and how we handle each of those conditions. We've talked about the importance of the core versus penumbra concept and how we have different ways of trying to evaluate those. We've looked at the roles of CT, CTA, MRI, perfusion, both CT perfusion and NM perfusion. And we've talked about some of our treatment options uh, and explored a little bit what we're doing currently for stroke here at Bay State Medical Center. So I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, reminder for those who dialed in a little bit later that if you're looking for continuing education credit for this talk, uh, please just send an email to Judy listing the date and time you attended the lecture. Uh, if you're looking at this lecture uh, on a recording, uh, there hopefully will be an accompanying quiz, which you can take, send the quiz to Judy and get your continuing education credit that way. And I am open to any questions. Thank you all for your time. And don't be shy. We've, uh, you can either put it in the chat box or you can uh, unmute yourself. I don't have people automatically muted and ask a question. Hi, Dr. Hicks. It's Sarah Mancini. How are you? I'm doing fine. Glad you're here. Yeah, I just had a question for you. Um, when it comes to post-TPA imaging um, for MRI, does it usually have to be 24 hours, or if the doctor wants it sooner, does it really make a huge difference? It probably doesn't because that diffusion scan is going to turn positive within a few hours. So we had one we showed there where it was done like seven hours after uh, TPA. So usually there's no great rush to do it. Uh, they just want to get one before discharge. So typically we okay. see them since we do so many overnight, they're often in the overnight shift after uh, right. the TPA. But the timing is not critical. You probably don't want to do it an hour afterwards, uh, but a few hours okay. afterwards should be fine. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Let question more of a comment. I knew there was a lot of, this is Mark Feely, I knew there was a lot of slices that the radiologist looked at, a lot of images. I didn't know there was this many variations that were possible. I know it takes medical school, but how do you possibly work through all of that imaging? Well, and any fortunately, efficiency? and we'll go very quickly through this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to get back to the uh, series of images. So what we tell the residents uh, is that, you know, in that first five minutes, the key thing they want to know um, is, is there a middle cerebral artery occlusion? Because that's what they're really treating. If you looked at all of those protocols, they're going after the MCA. So if you look through this series of MIP images, that's the one that really outlines the middle cerebral artery the best. So just immediately go to these images and look to see if that MCA is open. And if you see the MCA laid out nicely, uh, you can look at other pieces of the MCA on these two views. But that really answers the immediate question for them. You know, there's a ton of other data here. There are the neck vessels. There are lung tumors hiding in the apices. There are all sorts of things. Um, but their immediate question is, is there a hemorrhage? And the non-enhanced CT scan answers that. Then is there a middle cerebral lottery occlusion? Uh, and then not all at your leisure, but then you can take your time looking through the rest of these images. And the key as well is that there are certain things you look at on certain sequences. And that's a lot of these multiplanar examinations. You don't look at every structure in every plane on every sequence, um, because then you'll be here for a day looking at the you know 1,500 images. Um, you know what these images are designed to highlight, and you look at those specific features on the images.
No, thank you. And the more you look at the, the quicker you get uh, mm -hmm. at looking at these. But uh, again, that's what we tell the people in the acute setting, because when the stroke neurologists come in, uh, you know, the CT tech see them, they'll look at this and they'll be done in two minutes looking at the scan because um, all they're looking at is this MCA right here. They're not really looking for a lot of these other details. Cool. Thank you. A couple of minutes left, if there are any other uh, questions or comments out there. All right, well, I think we will close things out there. So uh, you can let other people know we're going to try to reschedule another live session for 7 a.m. Uh, since we lost the 7 a.m. this morning with some technical difficulties, and we will be making this recording available on the S drive with instructions to follow. You can watch the recording and still get credit for continuing education uh, credits out until June of uh, next year, I believe. So uh, we'll have this resource available and we're hoping this is the first in a number of uh, technology CME talks. So we'll be hopefully seeing some more popping up in the calendar uh, in the next few months. Uh, so while I have uh, this many people on the line, have a great Thanksgiving, everyone, and uh, we'll see you next week. Goodbye.